Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We're going to get started with another 4 versus 4. This is going to be on Canis Special Edition. I, it has been a while since I've cast a Canis game, and I kind of abandoned them for a short period because they all started to look the same. However, there's a couple of things that you can be guaranteed with a game on this map. You're going to have T4s, and at some point you're going to have an epic engagement a huge battle so hopefully we've got that to look forward to as we move into this game let's go ahead and introduce the teams and then we'll get started with it we've got leo taking seraphim titanium acu as seraphim as well zegolta he is taking aeon in the back slot and brs slevin taking uef in the front position that is going to be the north team and then on the south side we've got bulletproof bob as aeon headphone guy d Dash underscore dash B as Aeon in the blue color. I have heard it through the grapevine that he hates being referred to as headphone guy, but you know what? Uh, DB and headphone guy, that's a hard choice, and I'm typically going to go with headphone guy. Sorry. Grim Preacher taking UEF and Katara as UEF. As far as the rank spread goes, we've got about 1,300, no, 1,200 through 1,700, and it looks like reasonably well-balanced teams. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the action and see what these guys are up to. Let's see, we've got Expansioneers. We're going to be grabbing a Mex and doing a little bit of reclaim out there on the outside edge. Canis does have a substantial amount of rocks and trees to reclaim, but you've got to spread out to get them because they are strewn all across the faces and cliffs of this map. We've got some early Selens moving out. Those are probably going to be, yep, look at that right there. He's going to stick it right on top of that mass extractor, put it on hold fire, and that is going to deny the mass point for the first engineer that heads out there. The unit is going to be on top of it, nothing can build there, and unless you reclaim the selling off of it, yeah, you're going to have some issues. So, very, very huge annoyance. Best way to get rid of it is to ground fire a bomber if you've got one, or walk your ACU over in that direction, but green is going to be moving to the south side. Looks like we got a little bit slower expansion for Katara. He is going to slurp up all the rocks out here. Well, I guess you can't really slurp anything as solid as a rock, but he's going to reclaim them anyway and uh, use that mass to do his early build. There is finally an engineer queued to go out that way and grab everything on that side. Radar going down as well to hopefully provide a little bit of intel if anything's skirting around the outside edge. Going to take out that expansion. He will know about it first thing. T1 Bomber headed out for Zagoda. That is going to be moving to the right side, probably hunting out a hapless NG or 3 that might be passing by. T1 Scout's going to head out ahead of that. And uh, let me unwrap my tongue from my vocabulary as I'm moving forward here. That is going to try to get some intel on any targets nearby. So probably going to go ahead and pick up a kill on that engineer. In the middle, already got a couple of units meeting. That is going to be an Aurora paired with the Handy Dandy Scout that it always should be accompanied by. He is going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Mech Marine and win, obviously. Huge range advantage and a uh, bunch of tank, bunch of uh, HP and damage. It is a tank, after all. Nice engineer kill on that side. Gota is going to get the kill on that expansioneer that was trying to get that thing laid down. Katara is going to build another radar right there so he can get eyes on that bomber, but that is going to clump up his engineers perfectly. No! Bomber gonna fly right over, miss out on that perfect opportunity for at least a triple kill. He is gonna get a bomb off at those engineers, get himself a double, and then the interceptors are going to pick it off. So that is the end of the party for that bomber. On the north side, looks like we've got two players going air. Got a double land factory down for Slevin, and then expansion to the right for Red. Gonna get a couple more land factories down on the outside edge. So slow and steady expansion all the way around, just like you typically see on a land-based map. You know what I haven't seen in a while and I really wish would happen? Well, that was a nice little pickup right there for that tank and mech. Getting that Aurora and Scout. I, I would love to see some Salems on Canis. I have done that once successfully after about maybe 10 tries, so it's obviously not a winning strategy, but it is just so freaking cool to see Salem's moving across this map, and as I'm in the middle of talking about how that would be so awesome to see, I realize that there are no Cybrans on the scoreboard whatsoever. This is a Cybran-free game. Uh, that automatically makes it depressing, but I think we can go ahead and get through it. it won't be an issue. 
Looks like Headphone Guy is moving out towards the front, and we've got an upgrade going down for Grim Preacher that is going to be the gun upgrade. I'm not entirely sure how useful that is going to be, seeing as nobody has really gone full-on spam on the north, and Slevin does have quite a few tanks, but nothing to merit a gun upgrade from the other mid commander. Maybe he'll be able to put it to good use later on, I don't know, but when you're not being pressed, it always seems to me like T2 is the better option as far as upgrade goes. Because then you can just throw down the, the gun upgrade with a ton of build power should you need it later on. If you have the gun upgrade, you've got to get engineers on it to get the T2, or you've just got to wait forever to, for Tier 2 to finish. Titanium's getting a couple of land factories down. He's going to break free from that building project, though. Going to chase away all of those strikers that were trying to come up and get into the build power. If you can never slip any in, uh, tanks up in here, more often than not, the other player is going to have a really hard time dealing with it because typically your factories are going to be forward on Canis and it just becomes a hassle to get anything back there to defend. Looks like Headphone Guy is going to start pushing these units back, reclaiming as he goes. That's pretty much the ideal early expansion. You kill their tanks, you suck up the mass, and you build your own tanks. BRS is going for the gun upgrade, and his makes a bit more sense if I do say so myself, because he is directly across from an opponent, and he has a lot of T1 spam to back him up. So he's going to be able to get hyper-aggressive with that commander, potentially do a lot of damage to the south side of the map. First air engagement of the game. Looks like it's going to be a hard win for DB. And yes... There's only three reds left, but there is a nice little clump over here for Titanium, who has gone for some hardcore air production. That should be more than enough to engage what DB has on the map and win. But more reinforcements coming in for Interceptors from Katara. So everybody is getting in on this air game. It looks like that is going to be a win for the South. A couple more Interceptors dropping low health on a few, and there we go. Even Red getting an Interceptor into the fight there. But that is going to be a solid victory for the south side. Air control is always a good thing to have. Always, always, always. There's another gun upgrade. Good lord almighty. That is a lot of firepower going up for everybody. I, I don't understand. Why are we not seeing T2s? There's a T2. Leo is immediately jumping into the T2 upgrade. You know, that actually does make sense in some situations because then... You can actually defend your ACU against artillery creep. If you're in the middle of the T2 upgrade and you have a bunch of artillery come up on you, then that RD is either going to shred all of your ACU's health while you finish that upgrade, or you're going to have to abandon the upgrade at whatever percent and move towards the RD in order to kill it or dodge or whatever the case may be. But... If you've got the gun upgrade, your ACU matches range, actually it outranges a little bit the T1 artillery. So you're going to be able to sit there, chillax, get that gun up or get that uh, T2 upgrade at your leisure while the gun defends you. There is quite the fight going on over here. Headphone guy is doing a pretty good job of kiting with his Aurora, staying just barely out of reach and harassing those tanks. There's some pretty severe number disadvantage here. Um, yeah, that was a horror of a modifier grouping for any of you English majors out there. Um, there's a lot more units at BRS's disposal, but uh, if DB can master that micro and use those tanks effectively, Aeon should be able to more than deal with what's going on. Grim Preacher moving up, he's going to zap out that T1 point defense that used to exist right there, and he is going to push Titanium ACU back a very, very long ways. He does not have enough tanks to deny it. We've got some assistance from Bulletproof Bob coming in, and paired with that ACU, that is going to be more than enough to kill off those land factories, eliminate the build power, and move up pushing that ACU back. It's probably going to end up in the water, possibly crossing over, but one way or another, that is not going to end well. We do have a T2 factory for Leo, as well as for Titanium. Looks like he is going to be pushing Ilshavas. Should be able to recover at some point. Don't think that's going to be a huge problem, but for now, he is pushed back ever so slightly. Looks like DB has zero upgrades. That's going to be a bit of a problem because we have about twice his number in T1 units 
and a gun commander on this side. So that is going to be, yeah, not going to be pretty. He is starting the speed upgrade, which is going to go down fairly quickly because Aeon has the cheap gun upgrades, as we all know and love. But that is going to mean that he can still be outranged. So hopefully he can get both of those gun upgrades down before he has to meet his opponent in battle. Leo laying down an awesome overcharge there, killing off a nice little clump of T1s. He is going to be able to eliminate all of Grim Preacher's backup. That means that Grim Preacher is going to have to think twice about progressing any further, and he's got to get some units to his back. There's a nice bunch of them right here, but for some reason he's not pulling them up to his commander. Use your waypoints, friend. Get those units in the fight as quickly as possible. Looks like Headphone Guy is going to directly engage BRS. He does have the speed upgrade. He's got overcharge on his side, and as long as he pushes very aggressively, he will be able to deal identical damage to what BRS is doing. If you notice, he is damage soaking with his commander. He is kiting with his auroras in order to deal maximum damage, and he's got an ally sending him a mobile shield just in case he sheds a little bit too much HP. But overall, I think he did a fantastic job. He definitely evened up those numbers. There's pretty much uh, no more backup for BRS. He has a couple of units streaming in, but it's mostly artillery and anti-air. Not many tanks left. And the ACU is pretty much full health, so that is a little bit of a problem. But all in all, denied push right there. BRS is not going to be able to do much. He does have T2 on the commander, which could be a little bit worrisome, depending on what happens here. But uh, for now, at least, he has been stalled at that pass. T2 gunships out for Titanium ACU. They were right down here cleaning up a little bit of this mess. Had to pull back because there's a huge group of interceptors being fielded but uh, he does have them on hand for anything that might push back into the base. Leo is not looking very healthy, but he is overcharging some T2 units, which means he will vet up very, very quickly should a couple more present themselves as sacrifices to his commander. But he is going to wage war on all of the units pushing forward. Grim Preacher trying to gain a little bit of ground. He has T2 and gun on his commander, so those are identical war commanders on the right hand side this is why fire bases really don't work that well at all the mobile units in the back were able to deny that push but I was about to point out that hey if you got a point defense on the hill and you got a cliff on this side then you can just push all your units around the outside edge not take a single shot and pretty much just wreck everything behind that uh, no contest so yeah keep your armies mobile people you cannot rely entirely on stationary defenses, and that was a good example of a nice little mix. You got a point defense and a strong point so that you can hold the hill, and you've got tanks to react and help your teammates should the need arise. On the left-hand side, Leo still battling all of these units coming in. He has picked up another veterancy, and he is well on his way to yet another sitting on about 9,000 HP thanks to the awesomeness of veterancy regen. There is a Mercy connecting Oh my goodness, that is not going to be pretty. And a second hit, but he does have a T1 anti-air down, so that means that any following mercies will go down. And I think that was about it. Yes, no, well, nope, there's one right there. But now there's also interceptor coverage, so I think that any mercies that are built after this point will be an utter fail. 2,800 health, two more mercies would have killed him. Nice little defense there. He had mobile flak up. He got that T1 down very, very quickly, and Titanium ACU was able to push out interceptors to front for that commander. So that would have really, really sucked to lose him because he had the main combat ACU and most of the land units on this side. So that would have led to a hard collapse on the left that would have been a bit hard to recover from, but everything is fine and dandy, at least for the moment. We do have two mercies right there that are just kind of hanging out in the back waiting for someone to make a misstep, but I think we're going to be okay for now. That is one of the things you don't ever want to have happen. You get all excited. Your Rambo commander is going awesomely well. You've got all these units at your back. You're making real progress. And then mercies. Gut-wrenching feeling when those things start coming through. I'm impressed by how many interceptors these guys are pushing out. This is a real air battle. And we're sitting at 14 minutes still on T1 and T2 air. These guys are vying for control of the skies in a big, big way. 
Looks like we have some mercies out from red as well, but there is a single interceptor. Two bad mercies are a one hit kill. It's gonna kill one there and probably the other two before they can be launched. Looks like he's just gonna launch them at whatever he can. There is a beautiful kill. Nice. That was four T2 units, if I'm not totally mistaken. Those all look like T2s, I think. Maybe there was a T1 in there. Whatever the case may be, he killed a lot of stuff with that Mercy. The AoE on those is impressive. You definitely don't want to mess with them too much. And there goes another pillar. I am pretty positive that Mercy's cost more, yes, than a T2 tank. I would imagine, though, that if you're killing two to three T2 tanks per Mercy, you're probably coming out way ahead on the mass comparison scale. This is going to get dangerous for the north side because we do have a few units coming in from red and we have a nice clump of T2 tanks from blue, but if they don't get some more units to this side, their base is going to develop a pretty vicious leak. Looks like Zagota is... Let's see, minus 16 on a T1 commander. Is that a resource allocation upgrade? That is. He's going for second RAS, probably for T3 air shortly. So we may get to see a strap bomber. I wouldn't necessarily say it's an early strap bomber because we're sitting on the 16 minute mark, but a strap bomber nonetheless. The walking T1 point defense that is the mighty Il Shiva is going to be moving through all of these units. It is the perfect counter for Aurorus because it is able to reach out and touch them. That high DPS just wastes them without too much of a problem. Also, anti-air Ilshivas. Killing off all the interceptors on the ground. That works, you know. Well done, well done. That is going to be a pretty hard victory for the north side. There is an Oblivion turret down. Actually, two Oblivion turrets, which do a pretty fine job of denying Ilshivas. There's one dead right there, so these guys are going to retreat a little bit, but they did clean up that section. Hopefully, there will be some good reclaim there for whoever can claim it. Titans, I Spy T3. Grim Preacher is out in force. He hit, There we go, Percivals. I was about to say, why is he building all Titans? He built two Titans as speedy units to get over there and try to deny this problem. Since that's not an issue anymore, he can now devote himself to Percival production. I do realize that there's still quite a bit of T1, but the majority of the units now have shifted to T2. So there's really not a whole lot of reason to be building Titans. You're gonna wanna uh, get out as many Percivals as you possibly can in order to kill off all those units because Percivals rule the world pretty much at any point in the game. On the right hand side, Katara is uh, sitting around half health. He's not too bad off. Why is Titanium typing LOL? Usually that means that something atrocious has happened. Oh well. If something was there, I missed it. He's going to be building up a triad and a couple of T1 point events there to cover the gap. It's a UEF versus UEF firebase war. Buzzkill's going down. Yeah, that's pretty much going to be a stalemate. Don't see anything changing there. Leo has got RAS and is going a RAS. And that was a massive control K on those interceptors. That's going to let him reclaim all of that mass and use it to push out more T3 air. So we've got T3 air going down for Zegota. We've got the resource allocation online for Titanium ACU. And we're getting RAS and ARAS all the way around. So the northern team is turning itself into an economic powerhouse. We had some good progress from the south side early on in the game just in trying to push some units up into different areas, but they were not able to make enough progress to make a huge difference. And now I fear that they are going to fall behind a little bit. They do have some T3 air online, but green has already got more, and red is going into production as well. So these guys have got to get another player on T3 air, or um, DB has to devote himself 100% fully to the air game in order to match production with two people. That is a lot of T1 bombers. What is the plan here? There's too much flak around for those to do a whole lot of good in most places. Let's see, there's three mobile flak and a shield, several mobile flak and a shield. I don't really think they're going to get up into the base. There's not enough ASF to challenge. Well, they're on the move. We're just going to have to follow them and see where they go. Looks like Headphone is getting the ARAS upgrade. That's why his air production is a bit low at the moment. 
He has got a lot of things going on. He is probably massively masked off. No, he's not, actually. That is impressive. He's got several things paused. He is balancing very, very well. Nicely done, good sir. Nicely done. Bomber's moving around the left. That means we're probably going to be looking at something either green or brown. Although they are getting parked, so just keep an eye out. Hopefully I will not miss what comes out. That is a lot of flapjacks. A whole lot of flapjacks. Unfortunately, there are not a whole lot of point defense or tanks on this side. Katara is pretty much single-handedly defending his base here. And that means he is going to lose every single one of those flapjacks just as he was about to make some real progress. Here come the bombers. Oh, no. D those are headed for the ACU. The ACU is out away. There's mobile flak to the sides, but he is not going to be close enough to them for a denial there. Is that enough bombers to actually kill him? That is a lot of T1 bombers. A ton of damage. Smooth dodge there. I think he will be fine. But no, those ASF are going to continue their battle, and these guys are going to get a second pass if he's not careful. All right. Good, 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 good. That would be a shame to die to T1 bombers. That that would just wreck, wreck your world. No, they are going to get another pass. No way. No. <laughs> 1,200. That bad turn in pursuit by Titanium let Blue in air, but he's going to have all of his ASF over. No, don't get him nuked. Oh. There goes the commander. There you have it, folks. A UEF T1 bomber commander kill at 21 minutes and 10 seconds. I don't think that I have ever seen that before. That was beautiful and made my night. Holy cow. You know, T1 bombers, they don't do that much damage, one or two of them, but when you get like 60 of them, flying around over your head, then that is a lot of damage to deal with. So Katara is going to be moving up right here, chasing Red, saying, get the hell off my property, you kids. And the front player is down for the North team, BRS, doomed to forever be known as that guy that got killed at 20 minutes by T1 Bombers when he had mobile flak very, very near his ACU. Should have just pulled that in. If he would have microed in precise in a precise manner, he could have dodged the vast majority of that damage and gotten that flak in to kill it all off, but it is what it is. It is done now. So the northern team is going to be on its back foot from this point forward. We do have a strap bomber out, and like I said, we do have two players. Well, no. Still getting that T3 upgrade. That was a long pause on that thing. Looks like he was going for some T3 mechs upgrades before he started rolling production. So still pretty much one air player at this exact point in time. And green has secured the air win once again. Blue's ASF have been booted from the map. And that's going to leave this strat bomber free to lay down some fire on incoming Percivals. Titanium looks like that is the ARAS maybe? No, he's already got... I always have a hard time telling. That is going to be T3. That's what that is. T3 ACU upgrade going down. And there goes another bomb. One more bomb and those two will be dead. And then the last one can be dealt with. No problemo. We do have some Harbingers moving out. Hopefully that is a Harbinger of more T3 to come. Yuck, yuck. Um, we do only have one factory though. So this is about the stage where we start seeing, yes, there's a T4. We start seeing our first Galactic Colossus, maybe a Monkey Lord, something along those lines. Take a look around here. Probably going to see a chicken from Titanium ACU as he's throwing down that T3 upgrade. Maybe a Galactic Colossus from Zagota. And that is a dead mechs. That was probably a Strat Bomber wreck. There's a Sam there and a couple of ASF on that side. So I think that's what that was. Strat Bomber killed the T2 mechs, the last T2 mechs, in fact. And that is going to have to be rebuilt. T3 mobile artillery moving to the front. That is going to give Katara some pains because he is going to have to defend against the mobile arty, which is very, very hard to do unless you have a superior force in order to reach out and kill them. 
or some T2 stationary artillery, something of that ilk. Um, alternately, he could use some more of those T1 bombers because Lord knows he can build those T1 bombers as we just saw a few minutes ago. Maybe he can kill those things off with that. Two strat bombers on the field now. Titanium ACU is upping the ante on his air production. There is the chicken. He's actually not building it with his ACU, although that is now a T3, I do believe. Let's check it out here. Yep, T3 with resource allocation. That's going to give him a little bit of an upper hand here. On the south side, nope, there's the GC. I was about to say, the fat boy is not going to be able to directly match the chicken as far as potential firepower goes chicken can pretty easily kill the fat boy but that gc is going to be able to contend with it very very nicely so they're going to come out at about the same time should meet it in the middle of the map somewhere and we will get to see some t4 on t4 action for now though we'll have to study settle for harbingers actually the harbingers are shredding this base not settling for anything less they're going to kill off that t2 point events the only thing left between them and the utter domination of this expansion on this side is a couple of sniper bots and a point defense with a couple of engineers. So hopefully they will be able to move forward. Actually, lightning tank as well. I forgot those do have a ground fire weapon. So, yeah, awesome multi-purpose unit. One of the few things that Seraphim has that actually fulfills two roles and is not just a blunt force instrument of superior firepower that you build a ton of and hurl at the enemy. You know what, actually that's probably not an accurate statement because there's a few things that they have that do kind of fill a dual purpose role. The T3 subs have anti-air, the T2 destroyers do have quite a bit of torpedo damage to double as a sub. Yeah, that was a completely inaccurate statement. I'm sure some people have already written in the comment section correcting me, but hey, I actually got around to correcting myself this time, so, well... Let's be realistic here. No one's going to delete a comment. Probably still see something, but whatever. Titanium ACU throwing down some T2 point defense. That is a fairly good denier of uh, Harbingers, actually. Um, they just simply don't have the HP to march against an extremely fortified position unless you have a buttload of them. So many Harbingers. <clears throat> Which I don't think is actually the case here. We have four or five, most of which are about to die to that strap bomb. Boom! Yeah, one alive, which immediately dies to the second strap bomb. So nice job on the clumping there, bud. Way to lose all your harbies. But that is going to save this side. Five T2 point defense. I think the potential damage on that is actually pushing well over a thousand DPS, if I'm not completely mistaken. Maybe it is a thousand. Seems like these are about 200 DPS, maybe a little bit over a piece. So, yeah, that would be a thousand, eleven hundred damage, something like that. So, that would be able to kill off Harbingers fairly well. You saw them moving out for Leo, and he has got another one in production. Then we've got our first Yathotha done for Titanium ACU. So that means we're going to have two chickens moving down probably the left side. Maybe. Possibly. Hopefully. And uh, all that's going to be over here to deal with them are Harbingers. Maybe that ACU if he gets really brave. There goes the GC. That is going to be finished up, so he will be able to hopefully pull a little bit of denial on those two chickens headed this way. And I see a donut plan. Looks like we're opening up the snack shop and gonna dig into some junk food. The rest of these guys not building too terribly much. We do have that fat boy that has gone out. Looks like we've got T3P gens planned to be built. For those of you who are wondering why this is going down this way where he's got three building at once, basically you start all your P-Gens and you leave one T1 engineer or one engineer of some kind assisting them so that the HP doesn't go down over time. And that way, the buildings are already set. The foundation is there, and you don't have pathfinding issues with engineers trying to clear the way for a new foundation. They can just travel from one to the next and build them up. It actually works very, very well, and it doesn't waste that much eco. Um, it doesn't really stall you very hard. You're only burning, what, four or five mass on each one? That one is burning, okay, minus 18. But it's minus 18 out of 194, so not that bad. 10% overall. Alrighty then. So it looks like the map has settled just a teensy tiny little bit, but we are going to see a little bit more aggression moving in. We've got Red coming in with Harbingers. We've got the first Yathotha kind of sort of partway engaging there. He is going to pull back. 
I think that GC was probably scouted for the north side. Let's take a look. Yes, he can see it coming, so he wants to pull back out of reach. You want to get both the chickens together to fight at once, and you want to fight away from the Harbingers, because the Harbingers assisting the GC will easily kill off the entirety of that chicken in no time flat. Katara, oh goodness gracious alive, that is not a good place to be. That is an Absolver pounding away at the personal shield on that ACU. Personal shield com usually means that you're veritably indestructible. But uh, when you have that son of a gun zapping your shield away, your ACU could potentially be in a lot of danger. I cannot remember the last time that I saw someone using an Absolver, but that is a well-used unit doing a very, very good job of boosting the offensive capabilities of this entire force. We do have a fat boy going down in the back, but there are two Harbingers now moving in. A couple of point events going down, those will be able to kill those eventually, but some damage is going to be done. And there's the T1 Bombers moving in to attack those T3 mobile artillery, as I was talking about earlier. I won't call it a prediction because that was a long, long time ago, but I do like seeing things like that used. You thought the Pounding, is that, was that a T1 engineer? I think it was. Pounding that engineer into the dirt. Overkill to the max. Fat boy moving up. And that is going to be complete for Katara. Heavily damaged, but the shield is up and he is a firing away. So hopefully he will be able to kill off those T3 mobile artillery. It's actually very nice placement. The T3 mobile fires on a high arc, which is able to completely clear the plateau, while the fat boy fires on a low arc and is impacting the hill. Nice job there. Well done, Zigota. That is how you use your terrain to your advantage when you're in a fully simulated RTS. We now have both chickens together. Leo is moving in. Well, no, actually, he built both of those himself. That was his second one, and he's now building his third one Titanium still has his in the mid, and that is a lot of attack launchers. Probably going to try for a fat boy snipe at some point. Looks like Bulletproof Bob has decided to go T3 air as well. He's got no ASF, but a nice little clump of restores and just about a donut. Some T3 air out for yellow as well. Grim Preacher adding his ASF to the bunch. So I think that's actually going to give the south side at least matching numbers. Looks like DB has, uh, let's see, 80 ASF, let's call it 90 with yellows, and Titanium ACU has 135, I take it back, south side is, well, no, we gotta count the restores, which count for about three each. So it, it's just about identical. The extra firepower from the Tsar might make the difference, maybe, but we'll just have to see what happens. Dual Yathathas moving into this base. We're going to see a massacre here. Oh, oh, no. That was bad. <laughs> the large AoE attack just kind of hit that uh, protrusion as he was bear hugging the rock. Not sure what that was all about, but now he is going to be firing. So many Oblivion turrets just shredding the health on that thing and running. Oh, that is a good use of units. Look at this, look at this, folks. He's going to start reclaiming the Yathatha so that when it goes down, instead of giving the lightning blast, it will simply freeze in place, then stopping to pound away at the other chicken in order to keep the GC alive. He may make it. Yes! No, 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 no! <laughs> oh, that the final breath. That chicken takes out the GC. Well, that's a total wash on this side. We have a few Harbingers left, but all of the T4 have died. And I think this is going to be an air win for, yes, Titanium ACU. He was able to get his ASF clumped up, directly engage headphone guy without the restorers being able to reach on the first couple turns, was able to do hard damage to that clump and then wipe out what was left. So we now have firm handle on air for the north side. There are some ASF left. There is interception capability on the south side, but this is about to be a little bit sketchy. Fat boy is still struggling with that hill there. T3 already is wreaking havoc on this base. Man, the south team had it looking so good when they killed BRS, but it has just not 
solidified for them. I guess the reclaim from this base allowed titanium just to get a huge leg up on air production. Uh, they were not able to press the advantage while the getting was good, and now they're having to deal with that double eco in the hands of titanium. And overall, they've just completely stalled. It was a beautiful kill. I don't want to detract from that, but the follow-up just was not there. The, the Tsar is going to be moving to the left, and I don't think they have the air to protect it. So we may see the loss of a donut. Always sad when a donut hits the ground in more ways than one. There was a little bit of a dodge to get away from those tacks, but those strats just hurting that fat boy a tremendous deal. Sh couple of shots, and that thing is going to go down. So no more fat boy for the mid. That's going to leave that chicken with free reign of the territory, and we have one on the left as well. There are not enough harbingers to deal with the chicken, but there is the donut still. Just going to see what the air situation does. Man, I sure hope I don't get the hiccups. Use the swallowing technique, Brink. I think that got it. All right. That is a lot of strap bombers. I think we may be about to see an ACU death. Maybe. Maybe, baby. There are 26 kills on that. So it is doing something, at least. Ooh, nope. Come on. Gotta kill at least one or two. But no. No, you don't. Never mind. On the left. Will we get to see a death? Yes. I think that chicken is going to go down. It is shedding health rather rapidly. Here comes the ASF. See, here is where you need to get that good turn in. Because if you can draw fire with the Tsar and fall in behind, then you can win air using the donut, even if the donut dies. But unfortunately, yep, there it goes. Sorry, guys. Right out of the edge of the screen, but we all know what happened there. Air engagement on the left, strap bombers on the right. Katara is no longer in this world. Man, that is a lot of strats. Moving in on Grim Preacher as well. I don't think there's enough left to break the shields though. So we're going to have to wait and see what can kill that commander. But with that loss, Fat Boy down on the right side. Galactic Colossus moving in and not a whole lot left to defend. I think that is going to cause... The death of the South team. Man, it fell apart quick. Went from so good to so atrociously bad with the loss of that air control. This is where uh, T3 air might be a little bit OP, but hey, you should have built Sam's or something along those lines. I'm not sure what people's standard comments are on that. you got to have a sniping mechanism in this game, but sometimes strap bombers, they're just ugh makes you feel nasty and you end up killing people with them well well thank you hill so nice of you to absorb those shots so I don't have to take them in the face yet another chicken moving in on the left but those oblivion turrets man bulletproof built so many of them over there and uh, thankfully his opponent is smart enough to just continue to walk chickens into them why not send the chicken around this side? There is literally nothing in the way over here. Couple of T1 artillery, one or two oblivion turrets, nothing. You can walk that chicken in no problem whatsoever and kill whatever you very well please. But no, we're going to go after the fire base because we have to kill these freaking oblivion turrets. There's still enough there probably to kill another one. Shame for shame. Galactic Colossus biting into the map here. Biting into the base, rather. We've been looking at a map all game. That was even more ambiguous than what I meant. Grim Preacher is going to try to run around the hill here, it looks like. But that Galactic Colossus is in hot pursuit. It's probably going to vet on everything in sight. Chicken as well. So I don't think there's anything that Grim Preacher can do that will let him survive this. We do have a Galactic Colossus going down for... DB, maybe he can get it built up before he loses everything. That would be a great benefit. Let's see, Restores, pounding away at that Galactic Colossus. We do have a Harbinger moseying up from the back. And more Harbingers moving in from the north, but ugh, around the hill, Grim. Around, well, that destroyed any hope of him getting there. Thank you, teammate, for ramming Harbingers all up in my face. 
<laughs> Bullet just blocked Grimm's ACU. Yup. I don't think the Harbingers could have killed the GC because there weren't enough of them, but Grimm probably could have lived for another 30 seconds if he had made it around that little turn there. But uh, full-on blockage by that Harbinger. And now we have T4s in the base. Oh! Why is there a half-built Duke in the back? That may be a partial cause of the loss of this game. Because if DB had... <coughs> if DB had invested into air what he invested into that artillery... Well, he says he wasn't mass stalling, so he must have had a buttload of reclaim. Um, bulletproof Bob. Yes. 700 income on blips with 36,000 reclaimed. That's a fair bit. That is a fair bit. I'll give him that. But if he would have had way more build power on his air and turned that amount of mass into air, I think that probably would have won the air game. I'm not sure what all they could have changed, honestly. Definitely being more aggressive, but there were enough units on the map at any one point where it was a little bit hard to push across. And then, of course, once they got that other base in... Mercies! Once they got that other base in tow right here, Green just ran away with the air game. So, I think probably, probably MVP here is Titanium ACU for the north side. That strong air game... And a couple of T4s thrown at it definitely clinched that victory. On the south side, I did like some of the cool little micro things. The trick with the chicken on that side and uh, a bit of the, well, no, it was the north, actually. The T3 artillery over here. I love that trick. Some really cool techniques in this game. But unfortunately, I think this is going to be the end of it for the south side. We have a chicken moving in on the left, sniper bots accompanying moving in in that direction and then we have all of these T3 units moving in from the north that Galactic Colossus is going to be shredding the base momentarily and of course the sniper bot standing off and doing horrendous amounts of damage to that Galactic Colossus as it prances forward perhaps that's a bad descriptive term for a Galactic Colossus headphone guy can hide in the pond all he wants but I don't think there is anything that he can do to evade the death that is surely coming. Bulletproof Bob kind of chilling out on the shore there. Their strat bombers are probably going to be queued up on him momentarily and no Galactic Colossus. Ah, strat bombers from the other team. Fighting over the kill. <laughs> Zagota trying to get some strats in to get that thing but he fell just barely short of the required damage to kill that thing. Headphone did get his GC up. Is he really going to do that? No! Overcharge it. I want to see the overcharge. Can he do it? Yes, he can. <laughs> nice. All right. That is finally going to be the ACU death. Sure took long enough. <laughs> but hey, you got to admire someone who fights to the very end of their ability. Alrighty guys, that's going to wrap that game up. A good solid game on Canis. Hopefully some things that we can learn from, some things that you can try on your own as far as map manipulation and micro. So I hope all of you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please do not forget to keep sending me replays because I always need replays and I will see you guys when I cast them.